Today is December 16th, 2014, and we are interviewing Mr. Jack Beck at Hinsdale, Illinois. Mr. Beck was born April 14th, 1925. My name is Cheryl Walker, and I'll be the interviewer. Jen Shakuga will be the court reporter for this interview. Uh, Mr. Beck, where were you born? I was born in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And what were the names, your your parents' names? Uh, my dad was Harry Beck and my mother was Lillian Beck. And what did your uh, parents do for a living? My father was a watch repairman. He had his own jewelry shop and he repaired watches and sold jewelry. Did you have any brothers or sisters? Had a brother, older brother. He was in the Navy also. Okay. Um, what were you doing before you entered the service? I was going to school. I had finished uh, first semester at uh, college. And what were you going to school for? I wanted to be a mechanical engineer. Okay. This was college level. Okay. At this time, uh, would you like to tell your story, your military story? I'd be happy to. Okay. Well, uh, <clears throat> I was going to school, and of course the war was on, and uh, because uh, uh, this was in 1943, and the war started in 41, uh, so I had finished the uh, first semester in, in uh, college, and uh, it was January of uh, uh, 1943. I had an appendectomy. I went and had my appendix out. In February of 43, I went down to enlist in the Navy. And they said, uh, when did you have that operation? I said, last month. They said, go home. So they sent me home. I went back in the, the next month, March, I went back. And they took me. So I went in the... Uh, in the Navy in, in March. I hadn't done anything since January on account of the operation. So, uh, but they took me in anyway. I went to boot camp at uh, uh, Great Lakes. I was in Camp Green Bay and uh, went through boot, or went to boot camp and I was there for a couple of weeks and uh, I was in a little rundown condition because of just having had that operation. I hadn't done anything since uh, January. And I came down with what they referred to as cat fever, catarrhal fever of some sort. It's a uh, uh, high temperature, sore throat, this sort of thing. So I went to sick bay. And while I was in sick bay, they were giving me medications to cure the cat fever. And one of them was one of the myosin drugs. And the myosin drugs back in those days are the ones that were later taken off of the market because they were causing deformed babies and doing all kinds of bad things. And uh, while there, and the, giving me these medications, I lost my hearing in my left ear. I went totally deaf, just overnight, just like that. And lost my sense of balance completely. Just moved my head, I'd get seasick. <coughs> and uh, I couldn't walk straight, I was dizzy all the time. Uh, it was pretty bad. But I finally got accustomed to that dizziness and so forth, and I could stand up and walk straight. I uh, didn't throw up anymore, and they said they cured my cat fever, so they sent me back to duty. So I went back to duty and uh, finished boot camp, and when I finished boot camp, they uh, uh, asked me, do I want to go to a, a, a training school or what do I want to do in the Navy? And I said, I'd like to be an aviation ordnance man. So uh, that would be taking care of the guns, bombs, pyrotechnics, 50 caliber machine guns, anything that was used on the aircraft. So they said, okay. So they sent me to uh, aviation ordnance man school. I was down in Norman, Oklahoma. So I went down to Norman, Oklahoma and went through aviation ordnance school. And uh, I'm still a little dizzy all the time, but 
I reported that my ear didn't work, but they thought maybe I wanted to get out of the Navy. I didn't want to get out of the Navy. I just wanted my ear fixed. So nothing happened to get the ear fixed. Uh, and uh, as a uh, uh, graduate from the school, I was in the top third of the class, so I got my third class aviation ordinanceman uh, rating out of uh, uh, ordnance school. So from there, they sent me down to uh, San Diego, and I worked in the A&R shops down in San Diego. That's assembly and repair. So I was working on ordnance equipment in the A&R shops, uh, waiting for a position that I could get out where the, where the action was. And uh, so uh, I was having a good time down there in San Diego, but, uh, and there's lots of little stories about that. But uh, eventually I got transferred into a squadron. And uh, the, uh, the, the squadron went aboard ship, and the ship we went aboard was the uh, Wake Island. Uh, it was a CVE. This is the, uh, the Wake Island. Is this being photographed? Oh, okay. Uh, so this is the uh, the Wake Island. Uh, now the Wake Island was one of the CVE ships that stands for Carrier Vessel Escort. That's what the Navy thinks. Stands for Carrier Vessel Escort. Uh, we that were aboard the ship, we we knew that didn't stand for that. It stood. The C was for combustible. The V was for vulnerable, and the E was for expendable. So. <laughs> They're very, very small aircraft carriers. Uh, we had a crew of about a thousand, and we carried one squadron. That's all. Actually, they were designed for uh, escorting convoys across the Atlantic. At that time in the war, we were, uh, and, and before the war even started, we were on a lend lease program supporting England and shipping a lot of things over to England. And the convoys that were taking the things across were plagued by the German submarines. So the CVE was designed as an escort for those convoys. So the convoys couldn't move very fast, so they didn't put a very big engine in the, in the uh, CVEs. So uh, we would uh, get a top speed of around 18 knots is about all we could do, which isn't very much compared to the, the big aircraft carriers. Uh, we had a crew of about a thousand and the large aircraft carriers of those, of those days were the like the Hornet and the Wasp, and, uh, the Bunker Hill and the big ones. They carried a crew of 3,000. They were three times the size of our, uh, our little CVE. But Kaiser, with all of his shipyards, he could turn out a CVE and uh, turn one out almost every week. Uh, it would take longer than a week to build one, but he had enough shipyards that he could complete one uh, CVE each uh, each week. And we were number 65. He built about 120 of them all together. Uh, we were number 65. And uh, well, let's see, when was it laid down? I've got, I've got some information here as to <clears throat> when they uh, uh, laid down the hull and started building it. But uh, it was laid down, uh, there's a contract number in Vancouver, Washington by Kaiser. It was launched on September, on September 15th, 1943 is when they, they launched it. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> I was working in the A&R shops and I, I joined the squadron. And uh, when the squadron went aboard ship, I became part of ship's company, and uh, uh, in in ship's company, I was uh, assigned to the uh, aviation ordnance department, where we took care of the 50 caliber machine guns, uh, the uh, later on the rockets that they carried, the depth charges, the uh, torpedoes, bombs, anything that went into the aircraft, and. Uh, uh, so that, that was my, uh, my job aboard ship. So uh, we pulled out of uh, uh, San Diego and we had a little shakedown right outside of uh, 
San Diego and uh, to get cu accustomed to uh, sailing and so forth. Of course, as soon as we left port on the first rough day, the captain ordered the greasiest meal he could get uh, so that everybody would get seasick, so they wouldn't get seasick during uh, battle because he didn't want anybody sick while they were trying to fight off the Japanese. Uh, we assumed Japanese at that time uh, because uh, we were in the Pacific. So <clears throat> we did shake down and uh, some practice work and so forth out shooting at targets, things like that, uh, just in the Pacific outside of uh, San Diego. So uh, after we got finished with all of that, we uh, started down to, uh, we went south and we went through the Panama Canal, went over to the South Atlantic. And in the South Atlantic, we uh, uh, started looking for submarines. And um, we were part of what they termed uh, hunter-killer groups, uh, or hunter-killer group. And we always traveled with uh, several uh, destroyer escorts, uh, the small destroyers, DEs, and um, they escorted us. We were the mothership, so to speak. We would refuel the destroyers, and uh, we looked for German submarines. And we were looking in the South Atlantic, and uh, well, I've got the date here someplace. Uh, yes, this was uh, Squadron uh, VC-69 that went aboard the uh, the ship. <coughs> And that was in January of uh, 44. Uh, on January 11th, we uh, uh, departed for Hampton Roads and uh, uh, went through the Panama Canal. We arrived January 26th. But then we were looking for uh, uh, submarines and uh, uh, we were using some uh, equipment that we would, uh, the planes would drop that had uh, uh, detectors on it that could hear the submarines. And wherever they dropped one of these uh, sounding devices, they would, it would leave a stain in the water. And they knew the frequency of the uh, equipment that was in the uh, sonic thing that they dropped in the water. So they would be able to pick up that sound of the submarine from the thing that was in the water and they knew the frequency and the color of the dye that was with it so they would know the area where the submarine was. That's how we located submarines and we were looking for submarines uh, in the Atlantic. Uh, well, we wound up in, in Norfolk and then the ship was scheduled to take a uh, uh, ferry trip and take some equipment uh, over to support Chenault. I, we believe it was to support Chenault over uh, with his Flying Tigers. And they loaded a lot of equipment, or they were going to load a lot of equipment out of the, uh, onto our carrier, and so much equipment that we wouldn't be able to carry a squadron. So they took me off the ship and I went to school in Norfolk. I went to uh, turret school and bombsite school in Norfolk while the ship carried all of this equipment uh, and no squadron, so we had no planes on board. And that's why they didn't need me, so I could uh, go to school. And they pulled out of uh, Norfolk, they went up to New York, is where they loaded it up. They loaded the plane up, or the, the ship up in uh, New York, and it pulled out of New York. Third day out, they said, next port of call will be Recife, Brazil. So they went down to Brazil. They pulled out of Brazil, not knowing where they were going. Three days out of Recife, they said, next port of call, Cape Town, South Africa. So they went down to South Africa. And the girls on the street in Africa, the, the, my buddies aboard ship that were there, I was still up in Norfolk, they said, the gals on the street knew 
that we had been in Recife, Brazil, and they knew where we were going. They said, you're going up to Karachi, India, aren't you? Uh, mm, mm, they didn't know. They had no idea where they were going. They said, oh, yeah, you're going up to Karachi, India. So they pulled out of Cape Town, and there was a pack of German submarines waiting for them. And so they uh, pulled in at night. They hid in a, uh, uh, a port on the north coast of Madagascar. They pulled in there. And uh, it was Diego Suarez, Madagascar. They pulled in there and they stayed for three nights. They couldn't get off the ship. But they just stayed there and they, they hid. And then they pulled out at night and they made it up to uh, uh, Karachi, India. Now Karachi is Pakistan, but then it was India. And they unloaded all of their stuff. And we believe that that stuff went uh, across the north part of uh, uh, India and over the Ho Chi Minh Trail and over to uh, support Chenault and his flying tigers flying out of China. So then the ship came back, it went back to Cape Town, then it went up to Recife, Brazil, and uh, back to Norfolk, and I got back on board. <laughs> so I missed that trip, but I was still part of that ship's crew. So then we went out and looked for submarines again, and uh, we uh, went down into the uh, South Atlantic, and we did uh, find a submarine down there. I'm looking at my notes here to see where that was. Uh, we picked up a submarine uh, in the South Pacific and, uh, uh, or, I mean in the South Atlantic, and uh, uh, it was late at night uh, or late in the afternoon and the, uh, the pilot of the plane was a torpedo bomber, a TBM, and he spotted this shadow on the water. Wasn't sure whether it was a whale or a submarine or what. So he went down to investigate and started to shoot at him. He knew it wasn't a whale. <laughs> so he circled around and he dropped depth charges and uh, the submarine went down and uh, he dropped the depth charges and so forth. And there was a lot of debris came up and uh, submarines would do that. They would release debris to make you think that they had been sunk when they really weren't sunk. So uh, then you'd go away, and that's the way they'd save themselves. But uh, uh, the German, uh, back in Germany, admitted that they lost a submarine in that area on that day, so we got credit for sinking that submarine. So uh, we get credit for one submarine there. So uh, then we went on up to uh, uh, Casablanca, and we had a little uh, uh, leave time up there. And when a ship the size of ours pulled into a small port like Casablanca, they didn't have enough shore patrol in Casablanca to take care of anything that might happen. And, take care of the area and police it. So they came to the ship and they'd take people off of the ship and make shore patrol out of them. And they would pick aviation ordinancemen. So I became a shore patrol. So they got me into, uh, into uh, Casablanca and I wore the shore patrol thing and I, we traveled in pairs. So we walked around in, in uh, Casablanca to make sure that the sailors from our ship didn't get into any trouble that sort of thing. And we weren't allowed to go into the, the Kajbah or any that area. That was strictly for the shore patrol guys that were regular shore patrol in Casablanca. But uh, they told us not to eat anything and not to drink anything. You, know, you get thirsty or hungry, come to the shore patrol headquarters, we'll give you water. Well, we didn't do that. <laughs> we, we got hungry when we went into a restaurant. And uh, this is when I was on leave. I got leave there also. This was the next day. <clears throat> Went into a restaurant in Casablanca, which was kind of interesting. Uh, we thought, golly, we're not supposed to eat anything, but you order fried eggs. You look at the eggs, you can see if they look all right or not, if they're real flat or spread out, or don't look good, you don't have to eat them. So we ordered two eggs, sunny side up. 
and the eggs came out. They looked real nice. They were very small, but they looked fine. So we ate them. They tasted good. But they were so small, we ordered two more. So we each had two more. We ate those. Still hungry. So we ordered two more. So we each ate a half a dozen eggs. <laughs> and they were very good. Nobody got sick. <laughs> but we ordered coffee. And uh, we ordered cream and sugar for the coffee. Uh, we had a hard time getting through to them what we wanted, cream and sugar. And finally we got the, the sweetener part of it to them. And the owner came out with a like a ketchup bottle full of a perfectly clear liquid. And he wouldn't give it to us, but he poured some into a teaspoon and he put it in our coffee. It was very sweet. It was a saccharin of some sort, I'm sure. And it made it sweet. We tried to get through to him that we wanted milk. Uh, didn't know what that was. <laughs> So we went without the, the creamer or the milk for the coffee. Uh, but the, the eggs were good. So we got our stomachs full. And then we made a connection with a, a, a young lad. He was oh, about 12 years old. And he could speak three languages. He was from uh, Italy. Uh, and he could speak some German, Italian, uh, some uh, uh, English and uh, the gook language that they spoke over there. And he said, you want to buy some souvenirs? He said, I'll take you to a place. And if you pick out something and, if the, and ask him what the price is, if the price is right, I'll let you know. If it's too high, I'll kick you a little bit. Don't, don't buy it. So we did. We went in the uh, souvenir shop and picked out a few things. And he said, don't, don't, don't buy that. Don't buy it. He, took, he took us out. He says, come on took us out of the shop, went to another one we bought in a different place, bought the same thing for about half price. So he was really nice. But uh, a lot of the kids on the street would fold their money over there, their francs, they would fold the money in such a way that uh, a 100 would look like a 1,000. And they'd, they'd cheat you when they change money and so forth. So the Shore Patrol didn't like these kids. and uh, but. The guy we had, he was great. And uh, we were walking down the street. We made a date with him to meet him again when we came back to uh, uh, in, into town on our, on our next leave, which we didn't get. But uh, Shore Patrol came along and he started to run and they chased him with the, with the Jeep and they threw their baton at him and so forth. They chased him, he ran away because uh, they had a bad reputation there. But... Uh, <clears throat> Casablanca was interesting because we uh, we pulled into port there and uh, it seemed as though the people had a lot of money but nothing to buy. Uh, they, uh, one fella came out in a, a kind of a kayak or a little rowboat out to our ship and he climbed up the anchor chain and got onto our fantail and I sold him a mattress cover that I had. I was about ready to throw it away. I think I paid 65 cents for it when I bought it new. I sold it to him for $5. <laughs> so, uh, the, uh, the ship really discouraged shore, uh, shore leave. So they arranged for a baseball game on the beach. And they sent some of the guys that wanted to go over to the beach and uh, with baseball equipment and beer and they played baseball on the, on the beach instead of going into town. Uh, and uh, most of the guys that went over there, they sold most of their clothes and they came back, they had their, pant, had their pants on and that was about it. <laughs> and uh, because uh, the people over there just bought everything they could get a hold of. So uh, we pulled out of Casablanca and I think somebody in ship's stores made a, made a killing because uh, we were out about two days and we started to run low on certain foods on board ship. And uh, the exec wanted to cut us down to uh, two meals a day. And uh, our captain was Captain Tay. He, he was strictly by the book. And he said, I don't care if they're going to eat uh, beans and rice. We had plenty of beans and rice. He said, I don't care if they're going to eat beans and rice three times a day, they're going to eat three times a day. So the exec was overruled. We ate three times a day. 
So we'd have beans and rice for breakfast, and then we'd have rice and beans for lunch. We'd have both for dinner. That was pretty nice. <laughs> but we did eat three times a day. Uh, and uh, then a supply ship came out, and we started getting better food. So that was okay. So uh, and we got going up uh, looking for more submarines. We're on submarine duty out there. And let's see, what was the date? Uh, we took on a uh, squadron uh, uh, VC-58 on June 15th, and we left for Bermuda uh, as a hunter-killer group. Uh, and July 2nd, off the coast of Africa, the pilot of one of our TBMs saw a German sub, U-543, and uh, they exchanged fire, and uh, that, that's a sub that we sunk there. And on August 2nd at noon, uh, destroyer escort number, th we traveled with three destroyer escorts, DEs, and uh, DE number uh, 138, uh, which was the Howard, saw a conning tower uh, from a submarine, went over to investigate, and the Fisk, another DE, one of our escorts, number 143, uh, went to look, and at 1235, a second sub fired a torpedo and hit the Fisk and broke it in two. Uh, so it sunk the Fisk, and uh, uh, one of the other destroyer escorts uh, picked up the survivors, and <clears throat> brought them over to our ship because we had a lot better hospital equipment than the uh, destroyer had. <coughs> so they cleaned out all of the uh, uh, the chief's quarters, turned it into a sick bay. A sick bay, our sick bay was too small to handle all of the people that were wounded. And uh, the uh, ship that picked up the wounded and so forth came over next to our ship. And they were going to bring them on board, and the skipper said, no, wait, wait. Well, it started to rain, and ship is, the destroyer was next to us, and we could see these guys laying in the, in the stretchers on the deck of the ship in the rain, and it was getting cold. And the skipper said, no, no, wait, wait, don't bring them on board. So uh, everybody was getting mad at the skipper, and because uh, we could see these poor guys laying out there wounded and injured. And finally, he probably made the right decision. He said, the destroyer escort that they're on makes a speed run as fast as it can go to a land-based hospital where they can get better care than we can give them on our ship. And we will not be handicapped by having these guys in our, on our ship needing the care that they need because they're wounded. And we can't go in because we've got We've got to look for submarines out here. We can't go to port. So we'll send the destroyer escort in, and that was probably the right thing to do. So we weren't mad at him anymore. <laughs> so, uh, but we uh, lost one of our uh, destroyer escorts uh, through the sinking, and another one to take the wounded in. So uh, the British sent uh, two destroyer escorts out to go with us, and they helped support us and so forth and escorted us. And we looked for more submarines. We didn't see any more, we didn't sink any more. So uh, we finally got back to uh, Norfolk. So we got back there and then they relieved us from submarine duty <coughs> and they sent us up to uh, Quonset Point, Rhode Island. And up at Quonset Point, we were doing uh, pilot qualification uh, the pilots had to make so many carrier landings and takeoffs before they could go to combat. And if they came back for leave uh, uh, after being in combat a while, they had to make carrier landings again, to tune up their skills. Uh, and our job was to go out over the horizon and stay just over the horizon, and they would fly out from the beach and fly out and make a landing and a takeoff. And then the next one would land and take off. All the planes stayed in the landing circle all day. They just circle around the ship. And when the when the flight deck was free, the next one would come in, he'd land, push him back, 
take off again. And we were doing that from daylight till the dark. And our orders read, stay out there over the horizon until you have your hangar deck filled with wrecked planes. Because the planes sometimes would wing over, bust a wing, go into a crash cable, bend the prop, pull out a tail hook. Something would happen to it that it wasn't flyable. So then we'd take it down to the hangar deck. And the pilot would stay on board our ship. And when we'd take the wrecked planes in, he'd, they'd unload them all and fix them. We didn't repair any on board ship. We could, could have, because we had the crews to do it for when we were in combat. But uh, uh, there were just so many of them who were landing operations all day long that uh, uh, we didn't repair any of the, the uh, planes at all. And we made weekend liberty. One time we pulled out on a Monday morning, we got back in on Wednesday night, hangar deck full of wrecked planes. So that was real good duty for me because I was in aviation ordnance and these planes didn't carry any ordnance. <laughs> so I could spend the day playing cards or watching planes come in and land. Uh, and so during that period of time, I think I saw every type of carrier-based plane crash. <laughs> land and take off and crash on carriers. Of course, we were on a small carrier, so uh, it wasn't like the, the Bunker Hill or the large carriers that were a lot easier to land on. But uh, uh, we qualified pilots, and so we did that for, for a while. Uh, before that, though, when we were looking for submarines, sometimes we would have planes up in the air at night. We had planes in the air 24 hours a day. Now that was rough duty. Watching these planes qualify the pilots, that was easy duty for me. But when they had planes in the air 24 hours a day, that was rough duty because I had to be on the flight deck if any of I was assigned three planes. And if any of my planes were either landing or taking off, I had to be on the flight deck. And I had to take care of their ordnance equipment and the planes would go out for about three hours that's all and then they were back again and they always have a, uh, a uh, takeoff first of one group and then a landing would come in right after them so there'd be a, a takeoff and a landing and uh, we didn't really really have time to get down to our bunking compartments we slept on cots right underneath the uh, uh, flight deck uh, in the gangway up there, and uh, that went on for a little while. So it, it uh, that was a, a little wearing. <laughs> uh, we got pretty tuckered out. So, uh, but we were taking it easy whenever we could. So anyway, we finished finally finished qualifying pilots, and we went back down to Norfolk, and. Uh, <coughs> ship went through some repairs and so forth, rejuvenation. And uh, then we went down and back down through the canal. We went back through the canal again and uh, went up to San Francisco. <clears throat> so we're back into the uh, Pacific again. Uh, when we got to uh, uh, San Francisco, we stopped there very briefly and uh, uh, pulled out again and went down to uh, Hawaii and pulled out of Hawaii and we were headed down to uh, an anchorage in the South Pacific <coughs> down at Ulithi. Uh, it was uh, the biggest uh, anchorage in the South Pacific where they did a lot of staging uh, for the uh, invasions that were to take place. So we went down there and uh, got ready to go up to uh, the Philippines uh, and uh, support the invasion there when MacArthur was going back to the Philippines. I shall return this whole bit. Uh, we went up uh, uh, the north end of the Philippine Islands uh, in the Lingayen Gulf and put the army on the beach up there. Uh, MacArthur, eight times he walked ashore uh, so cameras could take pictures of him and get good pictures while he was walking ashore on the on the Philippines returning all this bit but so we supported the 
uh, invasion there. And we were out in the bay and our, our planes went in and did bombing and strafing and uh, a lot of action there. So uh, we supported that invasion. And we went back down to Ulithi again and uh, recovered from that. And we got uh, all organized again and and we went for rehearsals and wound up going up to Iwo Jima and we supported the invasion there. And we did some unusual things up at, uh, at Iwo Jima that uh, we're kind of proud of. Uh, one of the things that we did there, we had three Piper Cubs that were disassembled on our hangar deck that we had taken over. And after they secured the first uh, landing field on Iwo Jima, we assembled those three Piper Cubs and flew them off of our ship and they flew into the into the beach and they used them for observation planes. And a little sidelight story. Uh, I went on the, on the honor flight. I'll talk about honor flight a little later, tell you a little more what it is, uh, unless you know already. You do? No. No. Okay, talk we'll about. talk about the honor flights then. Uh, but I took this honor flight, which was all after the war, where they take veterans down to Washington, D.C. And <clears throat> I went down to Washington, D.C. on the honor flight, and one of the other fellows that was on the plane uh, got to talking to him, and uh, he said, Oh, were you at Iwo Jima? I said, yeah. And I said, yeah, one of the things I did is we had these Piper Cubs, we flew them in. He said, Piper Cubs? He said, my job was to take the Marines onto the beach, and I dumped them off on the beach, and they told me to stay on the beach and take wounded out to the ships. While I was standing there waiting, I see these Piper Cubs come flying in. I wondered where in the devil they came from. He said, now you know, they came from my ship. So <laughs> I made a connection that way which was kind of neat and unusual. But uh, so uh, we took those three Piper Cubs in there. Another thing we did at Iwo Jima, uh, they shipped some uh, material out to us. It was a yellow powder. And uh, they told us to put it into our uh, practice bombs. We had uh, just cans, you might say, shaped like a bomb and you, we'd fill them with water. There were water-filled bombs, and filled with water, they were about 100 pounds, and uh, like a 100-pound bomb. So they, they would use them for bombing practice. Well, they said, don't put water in them. Put this yellow powder in them and fill them with gasoline, aviation gasoline. So we were filling these water-filled bombs with gasoline and this yellow powder and loading them into the planes and the planes would take them over to uh, Iwo Jima and drop the bombs into the, if they could, into the openings of the caves that were on Iwo Jima. Then they would fire their tracers and ignite the gasoline to, to burn out the, the caves that were there. So uh, we were doing that sort of thing, uh, which was rather interesting. Uh, we also, at that time, they were, they were shipping rockets out to us. Now, these are rockets that were about, about three inches in diameter. <clears throat> and they had either a three-inch solid armor-piercing head on the rocket or a five-inch explosive head on the rocket. And there were rocket rails underneath the wings of the planes that were installed there. <clears throat> and the rockets had a, a T arrangement on the top which slide into these rails. And then there was a... Uh, uh, mechanism in the back with uh, two pins this way and one that would come in between with a hole drilled between and you, we put a uh, shear wire through and that held the rocket onto the rocket rail and there was a pigtail that you plug into an electrical outlet so uh, when the pilot wanted to fire he would press the button in the cockpit and that would energize the pigtail and that would fire the rocket and the rocket fuel would burn inside of the rocket at a very rapid rate and create the propulsion that moved the rocket and the rocket would go sailing off. <coughs> All well and good, except sometimes the pilots didn't fire the rockets. 
And when the plane would come in and pick up the arresting gear, the plane stops, there was enough movement there or enough stopping, the rockets would come off of the rails that would shear that pin and the rockets would go <laughs> down, down, down the flight deck. It was our job to go up and chase those rockets, <laughs> pick up the rockets. <laughs> they weren't firing, the, the rockets weren't fired, but they were bouncing down the flight deck. And sometimes they had these explosive heads on them. Well, it didn't explode, but our job was to run up there, pick up the rocket, unscrew the heads, the explosive head, the explosive part of the rocket, tuck it under your arm, take the rocket body, and throw it over the side. Because the rocket body wasn't any good anymore, because after hitting the flight deck, the rocket fuel inside of the rocket body would break up. And then if it was ignited, it wouldn't burn real fast and propel the rocket, it would explode and blow a hole in the wing of the plane. So the rocket body was no good. So everybody was excited about these explosive rockets bouncing around. And so we were the heroes. We would go up there, we'd catch that rocket and throw it over the side, but we'd save the explosive part. <laughs> and they, the, the rest of the crew had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> but they knew that they were safe. <laughs> so uh, that was kind of fun. So uh, that's what we were doing there with those rockets. So that was rather interesting too. So uh, that's what we did at Iwo Jima. But uh, during this time, I did a lot of heavy lifting and uh, my back got out of, out of whack. And uh, I picked up a nickname. They called me Port List. Now Port is to the left and List is leaning to the left. I was walking this way. <laughs> I was cocked over to one side. So my nickname was Port List and uh, I was in a lot of pain and I couldn't sleep. I had to sleep in a sitting position with my knees up and so forth. So when we left uh, Iwo Jima, we went back down to uh, Ulithi and there was a hospital ship there and the uh, ordnance officer sent us over to the, sent me over to the uh, hospital ship to see what was wrong with my back. And the uh, hospital ship said, nothing we can do for you. We're going to send you to a hospital. So they sent a postcard to my mother and it said, Jack is being sent to the nearest land-based hospital, period. That's all it said. <laughs> so my mother gets this postcard. <laughs> she knew something had happened, but didn't know what. So they sent me back to a hospital. <clears throat> and I went back on a troop transport, stopped in Hawaii, went up to San Francisco. And I was headed to Farragut, Idaho, to a hospital up there. But I got to San Francisco and I called home to talk to my mother, tell her that I was, I had all my legs and all my arms. Get her settled back down in her chair. Cause she was, she was really worried. I told her I was okay. And uh, she, in conversation, straightening everything out, I said, where's my brother? Now I knew my brother had been down in Brazil. He was also in the Navy. He went in before I did. He was also in aviation ordnance and he was a gunner on land-based Navy planes, and he was flying out of Brazil. And I knew that he had left Brazil, and he had gone back to Wisconsin, and he was up in Appleton, Wisconsin, going to Lawrence College up there. So uh, uh, I asked mother, I said, Where, where's Russ? Is he, is he still up at Lawrence College? She said, no, he left Lawrence College, and he got married. Now this was on this was on uh, April 3rd, and he had gotten married on April 2nd in San Francisco. And I was in San Francisco. I didn't know he was there. So I had called mother on April 4th, and Russ had gotten married on April 2nd. So uh, uh, I said, well, where is he? And where's his wife? Well, his his wife is on the way back to Appleton, so she's not in San Francisco anymore, so you can't meet her. But Russ is at so-and-so-and-so, and so and so. he told me exactly where he was. So <clears throat> I went over to his base, found out where he was located, found out where his bunking, bunking barracks was, found out what his bunk number was, and he was on his last liberty in the States before going to the South Pacific. So here I was in his 
bunking compartment. It was late. I hopped in his bed. I went to sleep. He comes back off of Liberty. He saw it's dark in the room. He sees somebody sleeping in his bed. He shook me. He says, hey, Mac, hey, Mac, what's your billet number? And he finally woke me up and I rolled over. He looked at me. He says, Mac, Mac, what's your billet number? I said, 2956. That was our home address in Milwaukee. He shook me again. He says, what's your billet number? I said, 2956, North Oakland Avenue. That was our full address in Milwaukee. And he looked again. He says, Jack, what are you doing here? <laughs> so we sat up and talked all night long. And we called home. And <clears throat> so we had a, had a good time. And uh, the next day, he left for uh, Hawaii, and I left for Farragut, Idaho. So, but I did spend the spend the well, the next day I spent with him too, and then the, the following day he left. So uh, uh, we had a little time together. I gave him all the money I had. And I had quite a bit because I hadn't been able to spend it. I had been aboard ship, and that was his wedding present. And I was broke, but that's all right. <laughs> so we got him taken care of. So, uh, but I mentioned that. Uh, uh, these odd things that we did at uh, Iwo Jima, uh, they earned us the uh, uh, presidential unit citation. That's this. Uh, these are campaign ribbons, and I think you probably know what they all are. Uh, some of them have uh, not only the ribbon, but the medal. Uh, this is the uh, uh, American Theater of War, this blue one. That's this one. I don't know if they can see if it's on the camera or not. Is it? Hold it up. Hold it up. Okay, this is the American Theater of War. Uh, and if you were in the in the service in America, you were entitled to wear this one. That's the blue one. That's this one here. And then this is the, uh, the European Theater of War uh, and the Atlantic Theater of War. That's the, the green one. I just wear the ribbon on the hat. And uh, this is the Pacific and the two battle stars for Iwo Jima and uh, the Philippines. And this is the Philippine Liberation Medal. And this is the Victory Medal. Uh, they're, they're also on here. Uh, and this one doesn't have a medal on it, uh, but this is the uh, Presidential Unit Citation. Because when we were at uh, the Philippines, uh, with the unusual things that we did there, they were noticed by the uh, uh, admiral in command, and he was Admiral Sprague, and uh, I have a quote here from him as to what he said, and if I can find it, I'll read it. He said, hmm. This is what he says with Admiral Clifton Sprague. He said, if your ship is as good as your air department and squadron, it is a standout. I must say the wake, meaning the wake island, the wake tops them all for efficiency, smoothness, and good judgment. I hope we are together again. So he said that and uh, said that he hoped he would be with us again sometime. And uh, apparently it got to uh, the president, and the president uh, issued the uh, unit citation, the unit meaning our ship. So our ship, uh, the Wake Island, <coughs> uh, it's a small carrier, uh, got the uh, presidential citation for what we did at Iwo Jima, which we're very, very proud of. So uh, anyway, I left San Francisco and went to uh, Farragut, Idaho, and the, that's a boot camp up there, but the boot camp was closed, the hospital was still open. I spent nine months in the hospital up in Farragut, Idaho, and they put me in a body cast and they worked on my back and tried to get my back straightened out. And I thought, by golly, <clears throat> I've had this deaf ear ever since I got in the Navy. Now I'm in a hospital. Every time I reported my deaf ear, they thought I was trying to get out of the Navy, and I wasn't. 
So I didn't get out of the Navy, and I saw a lot of action in the Navy, and I spent three years in the Navy, but now I'm in a hospital getting my back fixed. I'm going to see if I can get my ear fixed. So <clears throat> I'm in an orthopedic ward. <clears throat> they put me in big body cast and everything else <clears throat> to straighten out my back. <clears throat> I walked down to the eye, ear, nose, and throat ward, reported I had a bad ear. The doctor examined me. He said, yeah, you can't hear out of that ear. I, I know it. <laughs> so <clears throat> he was working on my ear, and uh, they decided they had fixed my back. So they were going to send me back to duty. So I told my ear doctor, I said, they're sending me back to duty. By this time, the war was over. This was the end of 45. Uh, I'd been there nine months of 45, and it was uh, getting to be December. So he said, well, just go back to your orthopedic ward. We, we'll, we'll see. So then he transferred me down to the eye, ear, nose, and throat ward, and a couple of days later, a discharge came through for me. So I got discharged. Uh, instead of uh, going back to duty. So I got discharged on uh, uh, d December 7th, uh, 1940, 1945, which is Pearl Harbor Day. <laughs> so uh, that was the end of my career. Uh, but of course, when they came around to giving uh, disability, they gave me 10% disability on my back and nothing on my ear. They discharged me on my ear, but they gave me no disability on that at all. And I still wanted to get my ear fixed. So I went back to Milwaukee. I was in Milwaukee. I came down to Chicago and I went to the VA hospital there. They examined me and they gave me a hearing test that I'd never had one like it before. I've had many, many, many ear hearing tests, as you can imagine. And this one, usually they put you in a booth, put a uh, head headset on you and you hear sounds and beep, boop, boop, different high sounds, low sounds, that sort of thing. And every time you hear a sound, you push the button and they make a little chart. This time, <clears throat> they put an electrode on the tips of each finger, put a headset on. And I said, where's the button I push? He said, you don't push any buttons. You just sit there and listen. They put me in a soundproof booth and I listened. And sometimes I hear a sound, sometimes I didn't. I said, what should I do? Should I nod when I hear a sound? He said, no, no, don't do anything. I said, what, what, should I concentrate on the sounds? He said, think about your girlfriend. Just sit there. So I sat there and I listened and I heard beep, 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 different noises. Finally he came around, opened the door. He says, you're stone deaf in your left ear. I said, I knew that when I came in. And I still am stone deaf in my left ear. So they increased my disability. They gave me disability on my ear. So now I get disability on my ear and my back. So I got 20% disability. <clears throat> so, but I'm still managing to get, her all, get along. And uh, I uh, got a new hobby. I'm a volunteer. So I volunteer for all sorts of things. <laughs> and uh, my wife gets mad at me because I can't say no. So now I'm a volunteer, but I'm unemployed. <laughs> and that's the story of my military career. Well, at this time, Mr. Beck, I would like to tell you um, how much I enjoyed hearing your story. Um, it's a wonderful history. Um, you explained it so well. Well, I, I wanted to tell you a little more about that uh, honor flight. I think that every veteran should take that honor flight. And I know they were, <clears throat> they got most of the World War II veterans to go. But there's some that still haven't gone. Because some I've talked to, they said, oh, I've been to Washington, D.C. I saw the, I saw the uh, World War II memorial. But it cannot match the honor flight. That honor flight is absolutely wonderful. And it's something that every World War II veteran should do, and now they're taking Vietnam and uh, later veterans. <clears throat> Something that happened on that, on that uh, flight that I went down on, we visited the uh, Smithsonian uh, Museum of the Air down there, 
and they had the Enola Gay there. The Enola Gay, of course, was the plane that dropped the atomic bomb. And we were looking at it, and there's a, there was a, a guide there, and he was talking about the Enola Gay and the bomb and so forth. And one of the guys that was taking the tour with, with me uh, said, I saw them loading that atomic bomb into the plane. He said they couldn't get it underneath the plane because there wasn't enough room from the ground to the bottom of the plane. They had to dig a trench down and put, move the bomb down into this trench, get it below grade, and then they pulled the plane over it so there was enough room, then they could lift the bomb up into the plane. And our guide in the museum did not know that. <laughs> so this is something that happened that it just would never happen again type of thing. And uh, it was just a wonderful trip. And we, we got to see more than just the World War II Museum uh, or Memorial. It was just a wonderful day. And they take real good care of you. And it was a, a terrific experience. And I think that every World War II veteran and every Vietnam veteran should go to on uh, Korean. <coughs> but uh, especially the World War II veterans, because there's fewer and fewer of them left. I'm, uh, I'm pushing 90, I'll be 90 in April, so uh, I don't know how many more years I've got, but uh, I'm, I'm proud of what I, what I did in the service, and I did my duty, and that's what it was. It was a duty. It wasn't fun. We had some fun there, but it wasn't all fun. Oh, one of the things that we did, I didn't even mention this, or did I? Did I mention the uh, tow target that we filled with uh, ammunition stuff? When we were out in the Pacific? I don't think I mentioned that, did I? I don't think so. Oh. <clears throat> one day we were belting ammunition. And when you belt ammunition, the ammunition comes in a wooden box. Inside the wooden box is a tin box. Inside of the tin box are little cardboard boxes with the 50 caliber ammunition in it and the belt links are in a little cardboard boxes I didn't mention this to you and uh, of course there's a lot of trash and uh, uh, we're belting the ammunition all the trash is building up we're supposed to take it down to the incinerator and burn it well, what, how are we going to get it down there I can't take all these little pieces well let's load it into the we had a tow target uh, <clears throat> a tow target is a big canvas sack that they tow behind an airplane that airplanes shoot at for, for target practice. Uh, in, in the target practice, we paint the tips of the bullets different colors and it makes a hole in the target. You can tell which plane, how many holes they made in the target and so forth. Well, this was a used tow target. We threw all this junk in the tow target because it's a big, big sack. <coughs> and uh, threw it all in there and just about filled that tow target had a hoist in the in the uh, belling room, so we hooked the tow target on, we lifted it down to the hangar deck down below, and we were about to take it over to the uh, incinerator, and clang, 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 they rang the uh, uh, man all battle stations. So, uh, under attack. Uh, so, we Whatever you're doing when that happens, you drop what you're doing and you go to your battle station. So we went to the battle station, we just put the tow target over on the side of the hangar deck. And after battle stations were all secured, we went back down, we looked, tow target was gone. Huh. Somebody took it away. Great, we don't have to do it. So we uh, went back down to our blinking compartment. And about... 10, 15 minutes after lights out, ordnance officer comes down to our bunking compartment, the only time he ever came down there. You ordnance men, get up to my stateroom and get that tow target out of my stateroom. <laughs> he couldn't even get in the stateroom. <laughs> the stateroom was full. <laughs> so <laughs> we went up to his stateroom and we tugged with it and pulled it out and we finally got it out of his stateroom took it back down, got it on the hangar deck, tried to get it down to the incinerator. We couldn't get it down the hatch. We said, now what are we going to do? Uh, it's getting later and later. Looked around, 
nobody around. And we violated every rule in the book. We took it out on the sponsor and we threw it overboard. So here the tow target went overboard and of course it floated. And that is a no-no. I mean, you do not do that. You do not throw anything overboard that floats, especially something that would identify an aircraft carrier. And this would identify an aircraft carrier in that area. So it went over the side and was gone. Whew, got rid of that. We went back down to our bunking compartment. Just about got settled. Clang, 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 man all battle stations. Submarine. They picked up that tow target on sonar equipment. <laughs> Thought it was a submarine. We spent the night at our battle stations. <laughs> we knew it wasn't a submarine. <laughs> but we weren't going to tell anybody what it was. <laughs> so we paid for it. But everybody on the ship paid for it. <laughs> so uh, that's one of the things that we did with that we shouldn't have done. <laughs> but uh, uh, you do what you got to do. Well, <clears throat> at this time, I would like to say thank you for serving our country. And well, I won't say it was a pleasure, but it was a duty. And, and uh, um, a duty called, and I did it. And so, I would uh, also like to thank you for giving me the opportunity and um, Jean, Jen the opportunity to hear your history and your story. Well, that's a story of my experience in the Navy. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Well, here's, here's the uh, the part of my experience when I became a shellback. Uh, that's crossing the equator. When you cross the equator in the Navy, you go through an initiation, and uh, until you go through the initiation, you're a polywog. And after you go through the initiation, you become uh, a shellback. So about two weeks before we crossed the equator, incidentally we crossed the equator on Christmas Day, and before we crossed the equator, about two weeks ahead of time, an uh, announcement came over the speaker system on the on the ship. All shellbacks assemble in the after chow hall. All polywogs take to the bilges. And that was the beginning of the initiation, because the shellbacks met down in the Shaw Hall, and they arranged for the initiation. Uh, from that time on until the initiation, and this was a period of about two weeks, anything that a shell back asked a polywog to do, he had to do. And I was doing jumping jacks on the fan tail while chewing tobacco, which I never did but my, my, in my life, and reading articles about geisha girls in Japan while they fed me uh, Tabasco sandwiches and <laughs> all this kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, on the day that you cross, we stripped down to our skivvies and they ran up the Jolly Roger. Took down the American flag and the Jolly Roger went up. And uh, we, all the polywogs had to strip down to their, their uh, shorts and up on the flight deck and in a kneeling position. And uh, uh, Davy Jones and King Neptune and the Queen in costume, beautiful costumes, blonde curly hair on the Queen and everything. Uh, they came climbing up the ladder from the forecastle up onto the flight deck like they were coming out of the ocean. And uh, they came out and we were all issued a summons to appear in court and we were charged with having done wrong and mine said that I had put peanuts in a shellbacks bunk without salt on them that's a no-no so that's what they were finding me for and then you go up and they, they find you guilty and then you got to take your punishment well uh, part of the punishment they, they uh, Shellback's got the, the fattest guy on, on the ship. And uh, he stripped down to his shorts, mustard and ketchup all over his stomach. And you had to kiss the, he, he was the baby. You had to kiss the baby's belly button until he stopped crying. Well, by the end of the day, there were enough guys that had beards or stubbles 
his stomach was getting sore. He'd feel your chin first, and if you didn't have a beard, he'd grab you by the ears and you'd go in up to your ears into his stomach. Uh, so th this was the kissing the baby. Then you'd go to see the, the mortician and you'd get into a casket and, and at the bottom of the casket is a little copper plate. After you're in the casket, he turns on the electricity and psh, you get out of that casket real fast. <laughs> and all the sort of the barber and you can imagine what he does with your hair. Of course, it didn't make much difference. We were out, out of, uh, in the South Pacific for the next month anyway, your hair would grow back. But uh, they do all that sort of thing with you. Uh, so you had the barber and the, the, the doctor and the mortician. And then they had a, uh, they took one of these tow targets, great big round tow target, and they had it filled about uh, uh, a foot of garbage and sludge and <laughs> old soup or whatever, with all kinds of garbage, and you had to crawl through it and through from one end to the other. And all of the shellbacks had made shillelaghs, a canvas sack about this long, and they'd fill it with uh, rags and soak it in salt water. Sometimes I, I swear they put batteries in it, flashlight batteries and stuff like that. They made this shillelagh and it was like a club, like a baseball bat. And uh, we'd get it across the back and across the buttocks. And we'd have to crawl through this tow target with the garbage in the bottom and every time they'd see a lump on the top of the tow target, it hit the, hit the lump. <laughs> it was usually your head or your back. And you go through the tow target. And you, we got back out on the fantail. And uh, they had a ladder. You climb up the ladder and they had a tank out there filled with salt water and garbage. And uh, a little, like, diving board. And you'd get out there on your hands and knees. And they'd say, are you a shellback or a pollywog? And no matter what you said, they pull the switch and <laughs> down you go into the into the tank. And two guys in the tank would grab you, and down, hold you under for a while, lift you up. You polywog or shell back. No matter what you said, you were wrong. Down you go again. They'd hold you under until you're starting to gasp a little bit. They they could feel you struggle and bring you up. Then you whatever you'd, you'd say, shell back, and then they'd let you go. And the funny part of this whole thing is. Our captain, a full captain, was a polywog. And he had to go through the initiation. And he was one of the first ones through. And he went through the whole initiation, and they did not take it easy on him. He went through the entire initiation. And this guy was a, this was our second captain. He was a great guy. And after he finished, he went back up to his stateroom, took a shower, got cleaned up, put on a clean uniform, came back down again. He says, give me one of those shillelaghs. I'm a shellback now. And he, got, he got in there with, with the shillelagh, and he joined in with the with the shellbacks, and he was initiating the polywogs. He was great. That was Captain Magley. Uh, Captain Magley, uh, I, I said he was a great guy. Right after he came on board, he'd see some fellas. They'd have their shirts buttoned up to the top and their hats squared away which is the way Captain Tag wanted us to be and insisted on it. And he'd look at him and he'd say, unbutton your shirt and tip the hat on the back of your head and look comfortable. My goodness, you look terrible. That's the way Captain Magley was. Uh, and he, he was out on the, the uh, fan tail one day and he had a pith helmet on and somebody threw something off the flight deck, which you're not supposed to do. Came fluttering down there, and he says, "Oh, both they're after me already." <laughs> so, so he he was a good guy. Uh, he's the one that put us on three meals a day when the exec wanted to only two. <clears throat> he was he was good, and he's the one we went to, uh, in the Pacific with. The Atlantic we were with Tag, and <clears throat> Tag was by the book. He did everything the way it is written. <laughs> so he was tough. Well, thank you for the story. Yeah.